Okay, welcome back to Launchpad. My name is Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood astronomer, and I certainly hope that this is, well, coming through now. Uh, it seems like uh, we had a little bit of a snafu, actually just a few snafus, just as we were leaning, leading up to this. I understand that there's some latency problems, and I apologize. I'm currently working on resolving those in real time, so if you'll just bear with me while I figure out what is going on here. You know, it's interesting how these things just, well, you know, always turn into a uh, little problem. So, in any event, uh, it seems like we may have these resolved now. So, <laughs> welcome back to Launchpad. My name is Christian Reddy. I'm your friendly neighborhood astronomer. And I also wear uh, a couple of other hats uh, in, uh, in real life. Uh, and that is, uh, one of the hats that I wear is uh, as a professor at Towson University. Uh, at Towson, I teach astronomy, and I would, to that end, I'd like to welcome some of my students that are here tonight. I see that there are a few people that have uh, already uh, gotten here from my classes. It's great to see you all. Hello, Josh Kim. Uh, I think I saw another one. And, okay, right off the bat, uh, this is, uh, wow, uh, <laughs> thank you so much, um, Christina Smallhorn, uh, thank you so much for that super chat. Uh, folks, if you're, uh, Christina is an old friend of mine and uh, a wonderful supporter, and I really could not be doing what I'm doing uh, without her. And I'd also like to welcome, uh, as well, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, my other moderator for this evening. This is the Urban Explorer, Neil. I certainly hope that you're getting uh, better, uh, better bandwidth now. I hope all of you are getting better bandwidth now. So uh, let me go ahead and just close that out once I can figure out how to do that. Like I said, I do teach astronomy at Towson University. And I also have another role at Towson, and that is I'm the planetarium director, which is a privilege. I was appointed planetarium director back in January of this year. I got to do all of one planetarium show, and then five minutes later, the campus closed and uh, we as you may know we did a few things uh, we did a few things uh, excuse me this is quite odd I'm actually hearing myself I'm actually hearing myself on the stream so I had to turn off another window you know what this is the, yeah you know you know what um, yes I think you're correct Hendrix this will be interesting because I don't do this very often, and I think it's already showing, so I apologize for that. Uh, but we'll we'll make it work. Anyway, like I was saying, uh, after COVID uh, hit, we were uh, left doing a few movies, and that was about it. So now that the school year is back, now that we're it's our first planetary supposed to be our first planetarium show of the fall season. Uh, I decided to just come up with something that we could do that might be a little bit more interesting uh, than just uh, watching TV on a Friday night. Although I do understand that tonight is the World Series uh, and uh, go Dodgers. Uh, as far as the Super Chat is concerned, once again, I want to thank Christina. If you uh, would like to make a Super Chat, it's always welcome. But please understand it's not a donation toward Towson University. It's a donation toward all of this, keeping this running. If you are one of my students, you are by definition poor and therefore forbidden from making any donations. Go become a nice, uh, productive member of society. Okay, so hello, Skylar. Hello, Arcel. Hello, Christopher. It's great to see you guys. Okay, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what's going on, since this is ostensibly a planetarium show. And I thought just a very, very quick look at what is in the sky tonight and just kind of some of the things you can expect to look to see if you haven't been out stargazing lately. So uh, again, my students are going to look at this and they're cringing because they have to see me do this all the time. But this is a view, a simulated view uh, from my home uh, up here in Westminster, Maryland. And this is the way the sky should appear right now. And we're treated tonight to a lot of beautiful objects that I invite you to go out and take a look at right after tonight's show. The sun, of course, has just gone down uh, in the west, and we have uh, Jupiter, Saturn, the moon, 
and already, already in the southeastern sky, Mars, right? So first talking a little bit about the moon. We have the moon. It is now at already at first quarter, or to be more precise, it reached first quarter as of 9.30 this morning. It will be reaching full moon uh, actually next uh, I believe it's going to be next Saturday, basically a week from tonight. So that's kind of cool because if you're out there doing uh, Halloween trick-or-treating, then, you know, you're going to have a nice full moon. Just make of it what you will. Uh, but please remember that if you are going trick-or-treating, that you wear a mask because it's Halloween. And there's also, a you know, a pandemic. Anyway... However, uh, looking over here to the southeast, we also have Mars. And Mars has actually been in the news a little bit lately because it recently reached what's called opposition. In other words, if we take a, a quick look here at Mars and we take a little zoom in, we have to zoom in quite quite far. Whoops, that's a little bit too far perhaps. Okay, but there we are. Uh, we see Mars here, and there's of course one of its two little moons, Phobos. But the reason why Mars was in the news, in fact, was last Tuesday it reached opposition. So what does opposition mean? Well, it simply means that Earth and Mars have reached an alignment in their orbit. So if my big fat head represents the Sun, we have the Earth over here and Mars is over here. In other words, Earth has caught up to Mars and has since just begun to pass Mars in its orbit. And it's kind of a neat thing because we can actually take Mars. Yeah, we could take Mars here. Uh, we'll go ahead and change our orientation just a little bit. And now as we uh, back out and we kind of have our lopsided view of the ground, uh, this is okay. Yep, that's a little bit too lopsided, but there we are. We're kind of looking at Mars, kind of looking at an angle. So here we are looking at it from the ground. And now, of course, we're going to change our view. You know what, I'll leave a view just like this. And to make matters very simple, the reason why opposition is a thing is because if we go back in time, to uh, if we go back in time to last Tuesday, what we're going to find is if we turn ourselves around and look in exactly the opposite direction. So with Nar Mars is in the southeast, now we're looking in the northwest, and we look down to where the sun is, and we turn off the ground. Boom! The sun is directly opposite Mars, right? This is what opposition literally means. The sun and Mars were opposite one another. So on that day, the sun was setting in the west and Mars was rising all the way over there in the east, 180 degrees away. It's kind of a neat, it's a neat phenomenon if you ever get to experience that. Even if it, when the full moon rises, you can just go out and see the sun setting in the east and no, sun does, the sun still sets in the, in the, in the west. Yeah, that's what I heard professors. Anyway, the sun sets in the west and then you could see uh, the full moon next Saturday rising in the east. But there's more, much more coming up because not only do we have a beautiful view of Mars, we're going to go back to right now. So here we are, we're once again looking toward uh, the southeastern sky and we can of course turn on the constellations because it wouldn't be a planetarium show if we didn't turn on stick figures and everyone goes oohs and ahs. So if you're enjoying it so far, please type an ooh or ah uh, uh, in the chat so I kind of know that this is at least getting through. But again, if you're having difficulty locating it, uh, just go outside, turn on the stick figures. You can even turn on the, uh, the constellation names to help you a little bit. I think you can. Anyway, and uh, you'll just see this beautiful row of planets going all the way across the sky. But like I said, there's more. There's even more because later this evening, later this evening, so here we are fast forwarding into the future. It is now uh, a little bit after nine, just after tonight's show ends, and we have the constellation Taurus. Taurus is one of my favorite constellations. And the reason why is because we have not one but two nearby clusters of stars. The first right here, this is a cluster of stars called uh, the Hyades cluster. Uh, let me see if I can, uh, there we go, we have the Hyades cluster and it has kind of like a V-shaped 
arrangement of stars. This is actually a group of stars that basically formed at the same place at very roughly the same time, below these hundreds of millions, probably billion, actually billions of years ago, right? In the foreground, if you notice here, we have our distance, and it's about 153 light years from Earth. If we look here in the foreground, we have the bright uh, red giant star Aldebaran. Uh, this is much closer. This is actually a foreground star, so it's really not associated with the Hyades. But if you notice Aldebaran, you'll undoubtedly notice that beautiful V-shaped arrangement of stars and this gorgeous cluster. It's a wonderful target. As you can see, you can see this with the, with the unaided eye, but you can look at this in binoculars. You're going to see this uh, very nice. So, uh, Urban Explorer says, I'm guessing I can see this now as I'm in the future being in the UK. Yes, you are, Urban Explorer. You are a future time traveler uh, being in the UK. So it is now uh, 1 a.m., a little after 1 a.m. your time. So it should be high overhead. But please don't go away just yet because I need you to moderate the stream. You could see how uh, crazy my students are behaving already. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me, uh, let's see. How do I turn this crazy thing off? There we go. Now. I point out this cluster because, and this is probably going to traumatize my students, and I apologize, but uh, if you look up just a little bit, you're going to see another cluster, uh, a very bluish cluster of stars called the Pleiades. And if we bring this in right here, there we are. We have the Pleiades, which is a cluster that's a bit farther away. Okay, as you can see, now we're at about 444 light years. And we turn this up, we bring this a little bit closer, change our orientation just a little bit, just to see this a little bit easier here. And it looks almost like a very tiny dipper. If you are familiar with the constellation, the big and little dipper, that's kind of what we see here. So uh, we have uh, a cluster of very hot stars. And these stars are relatively young and when we say young, what we mean is that we're talking about stars that are perhaps only just a few tens to hundreds of millions of years old. They're quite young and they're extremely hot. And if you've ever taken an astronomy class or if you're in my astronomy class, then you know that this, in this intimates that these are extremely, uh, because they're blue, they are extremely hot stars. Okay, what's all this blue haze? going on here, right? All of this blue haze is, well, it's a combination of two things. It's thought to be, some of it is thought to be a little bit of dust from the stellar nursery that it was born in. And the rest is thought to be a, a kind of an intervening dust cloud that it's passing through. So you've got this light from the star, or light from these stars, it's about a thousand stars in this cluster, and it's setting off all of this scattering. Right, for the exact same reason that we have a blue sky during the daytime, we are seeing blue light scattered here. And our cell just said, and again, sorry for all the inside baseball here, but my students are pointed out that we just did the Pleiades lab yesterday. Yes, we did. We actually, in our class, we actually measured the distance to three of these stars and we took their temperatures and did all kinds of cool things. So yeah, anyway. That's enough with what's in the sky tonight, because there's one more bit that I'd like to tell you about that I think is worth just kind of, oh, I don't know, mentioning, and that is even though we may not be able to always be outside looking at the stars 24-7, we have spacecraft in our solar system that are taking up close and direct looks at the sites that we've never seen before. Namely, this week we had our direct encounter with the asteroid Bennu. And this has been a mission such a This mission has been uh, just years in the making and for about two years the OSIRIS-REx orbiter, to the extent that you can orbit an asteroid, <laughs> was orbiting and taking a very highly detailed, making a very highly detailed map of Bennu. And they found very rough terrain, much rougher than what they anticipated, but they finally located this tiny patch called Nightingale. And the reason why they were looking for this patch, even though it was much, much smaller than expected, was because the Osiris-Rex 
spacecraft was to descend and extend its sample collection arm. So you could see that the original touch and go zone or tag zone was far larger than what they ended up with. All they really had was something about the size of a few parking spaces. So they reached their sample collector down and they, in, they, uh, they ejected a bottle of nitrogen gas, which created kind of like a, an inverse vacuum, you might say, and scattered all these particles out of the canister. And here are the real images taken Tuesday. So these are obviously still frames that have been stitched together and boom, as we make contact, as Osiris Rex make, makes contact, suddenly uh, the nitrogen is expelled, kicks up a lot of dust. They had about five seconds of contact on the surface and they started backing away immediately because now you've got rocks and regolith everywhere. So the plan was to basically weigh how much mass they got and the way you the, how you weigh how you weigh something in space when there is no scale you extend it out and you measure what's called the moment of inertia but these images just came in just a, about an hour or two ago and you can see that the sample collector is full of rocks lots of stuff lots of particles and so much stuff was in the canister that it's actually been some of it's been escaping through these tiny little uh, vent holes for the gas so the whole maneuver of measuring the mass was canceled. They decided, never mind, we have enough. We know we got enough. We could see the rocks right up against the grating uh, there in the small vent holes. And so what they're going to do instead is just stow the samples, right? But it's just amazing. I mean, we only got this just a couple of hours ago, and I was in the midst of prepping for tonight's uh, talk and then this came in and I had to add this, but you know, you just got to talk about just these wonderful problems to have. So the next step uh, for the Osiris Rex mission will be to, to stow uh, the canister in a, uh, in a return module. And then Osiris Rex in 2023 will finally return toward Earth where it will eject the canister sample module and if everything goes well uh, we'll be able to open it up and we're going to see some beautiful pristine Bennu regolith so just how cool is that I mean you know it's amazing what we can do right when we put our put our minds to it we we, we can be clever apes once in a while don't you think so uh, anyway I just wanted to share that with you because that's so exciting uh, I I uh, I, I, I'm going to confess something right now. I'm going to tell you that, um, you know, as an astronomer, I'm more of like a star guy. You know, if there's something going on with stars or black holes or even galaxies, I'm really right on top of it. I'm, 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 I confess I'm a little bit like I keep forgetting about the solar system. And I knew that this was going to happen. I was kind of like, oh, yeah, this is OK, cool. And then finally, there was like a live stream on Tuesday night. They're going to make contact and I'm watching it. And I'm like totally glued. and I'm just going, oh, my God, oh my God, oh my God. Hey, you know, and <laughs> wife comes in. We they made contact with the asteroid, or at least the call out was they made contact with the asteroid. Brought the sample back in, and I've just been hooked on this mission ever since. So again, huge, huge uh, uh, congrats to NASA and to the Osiris Rex team. Uh, if that isn't uh, some exciting news, uh, I don't know what is. Uh, but uh, that was tremendously exciting. Anyway. So with that, I'd like to get on with our main uh, topic tonight uh, because, you know, I wanted to, I've had this idea for a while to maybe in lieu of doing a planetarium show, since it's really hard to do a full blow show online like this when you're not inside of a dome, I kind of thought, what if we could have some guests come on? They could tell us about some exciting projects that they're working on. And over the summer, I stumbled upon an amazing, uh, I, I read this article on the Planetary Society's website, and it was about the, the ambitious project to image an exoplanet, not just take its spectrum, not just detect its presence, but to actually image it, to actually reveal coastlines. And the whole idea, I, I couldn't believe it, it basically works something like this. You know, the idea is that you can take the sun and you can use it as a gravitational lens 
and you can then bend, literally bend, the light from a planet behind it, maybe a, a few hundred light years behind it, and you can actually bring that light to a focus and you can create an image. And I was completely blown away by this idea. And I didn't understand how this can work. How do you make an image out of a gravitational lens? Uh, gravitational lenses aren't new, but making an image from one, I thought that was incredible. It can't possibly work, can it? But I did some more research and I discovered, yeah, it can work. And then I reached out uh, t uh, to ask some questions of my guests tonight, and uh, they were so kind to make me smart enough about this topic to actually make a video about it. But forget my video. I've got two of the main drivers of the Solar Gravitational Lens Mission. Uh, please welcome Dr. Slava G. Turishev, the Principal Investigator of the Solar Gravitational Lens Focus Mission, and Dr. Lewis Friedman, Executive Director Emeritus and Co-Founder of the Planetary Society, which, by the way, he formed with None other than none other than Carl Sagan. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Good to have you. Very nice, nice to be here. Oh wow! Uh, you know, I um, I hope I didn't do as uh, bad a job uh, setting up the mission as I did, or setting up this uh, interview as I did in my video of <laughs> describing it. But I hope, uh, Slava, I'd like to just begin with you, please. I mean, this is just such a uh, an ambitious mission, but. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about why uh, we want to do something like this and then what that will entail? Like, how does one actually go about imaging an exoplanet? Christian, for me, this is personal. And personal, um, going back to my childhood, uh, I was uh, born and raised in Siberia. And uh, during those dark nights, when you go in the local mountains, I could see a lot of stars. They're bright, they're so close, but is there life? The question always was, are we alone in this uh, in the universe? And uh, as I grew up, I realized that there are plenty of stars, but at that time we had no idea that exoplanets exist. And only, uh, only, uh, only 25 uh, years ago, we started uh, discovering them. And so mm -hmm. now we know almost uh, 5,500 uh, exoplanets around nearby stars. And we are able to discover lots of uh, exo-Jupiters and uh, Saturns, and we start discovering uh, super-Earths. So it's only a matter of time then, uh, we will, uh, when we will start discovering uh, Earths, er 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 the Earth-like planets. And the next step would be to look at the spectra and then understand spectroscopy of the atmospheres, if atmosphere is there. And potentially, we will be able, within this uh, decade, potentially discover objects that may harbor life. Hmm. And so that's a major motivation, because now we have uh, not only the knowledge that we are not alone in terms of you know, planets, the exoplanets are ubiquitous in everywhere in the universe. And so the multiplanetary systems, such as TRAPPIST, we have uh, discovered. So the next step is, what do we do? And the obvious thing would be to fly there. And flying there probably is uh, not possible within the next 100 years. So but what can be remotely? And as you look at uh, available instruments and uh, uh, try to use them to observe those uh, distant, very faint objects such as exoplanets, you really quickly realize that those telescopes must be very big. For example, if you take our own planet Earth and put it at 100 light years away from us, you must have access to a 90 kilometer aperture to be able to resolve, to see this planet with just one pixel. So immediately you can understand that basically whatever technologies we have, whatever instruments we'll be able to build, the largest telescope on the ground is going to be 39 meters. Hmm. And the largest telescope <laughs> in space will be what? 6.5 meters flowed, launched in the next year. James this Webb. Is where right? the idea of, James Webb. So this is where the idea of using solar gravitational lens came about because we know that uh, thanks to Albert Einstein, we know that uh, when light uh, travels nearby a massive body, its trajectory is uh, bent. 
as a giant lens. In the, in the case of the solar system, the best lens we have is our own sun. And uh, the effect of gravitational bending was observed and studied by many experiments. And we know well that solar gravity is able to bend the light. Uh, it's good. So we have the bending of light. But uh, the challenge here is that the two light rays, which are going on opposite side of the sun, will ult uh, ultimately intersect and will meet each other, but at a very long distance. It's uh, 550 astronomical units away. And uh, so the, uh, back then, maybe about 20 years ago, it would be a challenge. But now you realize that we have a Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 1, that is going at roughly, what is 150 astronomical units. And potentially you can start think, thinking about technological advances that were made for the last, during the last 20 years. And with the recent uh, major progress in uh, small spacecraft, especially solar sailing spacecraft, we can now contemplate a realistic mission that can take us there within roughly 20 to 25 years. And it's now already, as we say, within the lifetime of a scientist. So you can contemplate the mission and get there, collect the data and see for the first time continental lines, weather patterns, topography on the planet that may harbor life. So that's the motivation. I, I uh, thank you so much for that. I mean, it seems like uh, it seems like this is a uh, an attempt at, as you said, you're trying to use the sun as a gravitational lens. But did I understand you correctly? I think you said that you'd actually would have to back your telescope away from the sun in order to look back and see this gravitational lensing effect and. You said it was pretty far away. Could you uh, remind us again just about how far away you got to go? It is uh, 550 astronomical units away from the sun. So it's, wow. a, <laughs> it's a large distance. And uh, th this, will, yeah, this, is, uh, this is the major challenge, actually, because uh, once it, uh, if we were to have those th the needed technology already, we can fly this mission today. Realistically, the technologies that you have already, uh, I'll, we can think that we can do this in the next 10-15 years, because solar sail and spacecraft are capable of reaching very high velocity, and Lou will talk about this. Hmm. And the advancements in the small sun design, uh, you, you can rely on these advancements and really can position a spacecraft way outside the solar system. And now we have a very good reason to go outside the solar system and to develop those technologies that will take us much further than we ever been. And because uh, in the past, the many people would suggest to go outside to very deep regions of the solar system, but we need a good, we need to have a very strong motivation. Imaging of exoplanet and seeing life on a, diff a very distant world would present, present in such a wonderful motivation for us to put those technologies together and travel to those long distances where uh, the focal region of the solar gravitational lens begins. With the solar, with the sun being the amazing lens it provides a significant light amplification that is not possible otherwise well and we can ab and we are able to resolve very fine details with that lens so that's why we need to go there well that's a okay so so again 550 au you said it there it was we really are talking about sending a uh, a telescope of sorts out of the solar system for all intents and purposes, right? Voyager 1, I believe, is about 130 astronomical units from the sun at the moment, and it took, well, let's see, it was launched in 1977, so it was quite a bit of, it was a few years ago, right? And uh, we are, uh, you know, we are declaring it as interstellar space, depending on how you define interstellar space. This just blows Voyager 1's record away, but we don't have, I mean, 43 years ago was when Voyager 1 launched. We don't really want to wait quite that long, right? I mean, I think we want to try to get these images within within uh, uh, our lifetime. I, I guess yours Absolutely. in particular. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So the technologies that we have now, chemical technologies with the chemical propulsion, they are very reliable and we, we have proven them on many, many missions, uh, space missions into to the deep space. But once we start using these technologies, we are faced with a very long mission lifetime. So we have to travel to those distances. It will take a long time. So we need to do. We need to have something different, mm -hmm. and that different comes from the sun again, from our own sun, because solar radiation pressure 
can propel solar sail in spacecraft to very fast velocities. And we can reach velocities much faster than uh, were uh, achieved by any other spacecraft, including New Horizons, that was able to reach amazing three astronomical units per year. We can do much faster. We can do much faster already uh, with the existing technologies. We can do probably within uh, three to four years, we can reach seven to 10 astronomical units per year. And then with the new technology, with the new sail materials, we can reach all the way to 2025 EU per year. So this is happening now. This technology is being developed in the laboratories and being tested elsewhere. Well, I, I, and to that end, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Lou, if you would mind uh, maybe elaborating a little bit of that. So, uh, you know, it's what Slava says is that just trying to get out there with the chemical rocket, which is what we use today, of course, uh, it's, it's it doesn't seem like it's going to happen, at least not within anybody's lifetime, right? Uh, but, you know, your background is in mission design and actually figuring out the logistics. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how, how you came into this uh, project and, and why you think that solar sailing uh, is the way to go. Well, thanks. And uh, it's nice to be here with you and certainly nice to be with Slava. He's the one who inspired the whole idea when he described that we could get images of another world uh, uh, by this technique and that that's what piques my interest is I like to make missions happen and uh, uh, so immediately the initial idea would be of course like, like I said use a big rocket and see how fast we could get there well Voyager had a big rocket and even if we had the Saturn V rocket which is long in our past we we don't have it now or the SLS which is going to be sometime in the future they would still take about 50 or more years to get out to that kind of distance and uh, it would be an enormous task to uh, to take a big rocket and uh, and to try to get there if we loaded that rocket up with engines to boost it along the way even nuclear engines it would be a massive uh, and very expensive mission and it's not a technology that we have the advantage of solar sailing, and this is what, what piques my interest so much, two things that you really need to know. One is it doesn't carry its propellant. It doesn't have to carry any propellant at all. It gets its energy from the sun, and uh, it gets its energy from the photons of the sun, which push on a large reflective sail, and uh, just like a sailboat operates on the principle of the interface between water and wind, a solar sail uh, operates on the principle of the interface between photon energy coming out of the sun like the wind and orbital motion, gravitation, which acts like the water and it, uh, the medium that it's flowing through. And uh, so the spacecraft basically has its velocity modified by the solar force at all times. We can fly in toward the sun like tacking, or we can fly outward from the sun by running before the wind, except it's not the solar wind, it's the solar photon pressure. So we can maneuver anywhere in the solar system. What makes this mission possible is we do both. We first fly in toward the sun, picking up an enormous amount of energy and picking up an enormous amount of sunlight as well. And right at the perihelion, the closest approach to the sun, we get all this velocity boost. Uh, and that provides an enormous push to get out to, at very fast velocities. We'll get up to uh, even uh, uh, many hundreds of kilometers a second as we go past the sun. And even as we go out from the sun, a hyperbolic trajectory. That's a trajectory which is no longer contained by the solar system, no longer contained in our solar system. It's flying basically on a straight line out of the solar system. And it will reach an exit velocity of approximately, uh, depending on how close we come to the sun and how large the sail is, uh, it'll reach a velocity of up to 20 AU per year. So if you want to get to 550 AU, uh, you can get there in 20, uh, in 20 to 30 years. Uh, and what Slava also requires is not just getting to 550 AU, but going beyond that, because the solar gravity lens focal uh, region is not a point. It's a line. It extends out infinitely from 550 AU, hmm. because the rays bend around the sun at different uh, angles. And so we get, uh, we can basically fly on a straight line uh, following this uh, focal line away from the sun. And uh, we'll do so at a 
very high velocity, 20 to 30 AU per year, uh, without using any propellant except for the little bit we might have to carry to make maneuvers around to do the imaging that uh, that we want to uh, actually capture the image of the uh, lens. So what makes solar sailing exciting is is that it, uh, it it's a romantic idea. You're out in space with no propellant, but it, and a beautiful idea. It has these beautiful uh, spacecraft with, uh, and also you want a very small spacecraft because the force you get is proportional to the area of the sail and the divided by the mass of the spacecraft. So the bigger you can make the area and the smaller you can make the mass, the faster you can go. And this is what we're working on right now, and it's been a gr great lot of fun to do innovative mission design. I'm not hearing you right now. Chris, I think you're muted. I am muted. Okay, yeah. So um, I need I need a producer. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so because uh, while you were talking, I was uh, scurrying around looking for graphics to, to pop up a little bit. That might help illustrate it. I at least hope I was able to illustrate the, the concept of the in-spiral trajectory. And, and if uh, I may jump, uh, if, if I may jump here, maybe please. very quickly. On that chart that you showed, it takes us only three months uh, to get from one AU orbit uh, onto the solar perihelion. So it, uh, we can tuck into the wind like a sailboat. Once we get there, because we have articulated uh, veins on the spacecraft, it's a, it's a new design for the spacecraft that we have. We can tuck into the wind, and then once we go in by the sun, we uh, articulate veins uh, to achieve the most optimal and the fastest trajectory. And the solar sails, we can go outside the ecliptic plane which is very difficult to do with any other types of propulsion currently. So we can go outside the ecliptic plane, therefore we are not target constraints. Constraint. We can go to any target to see any any exoplanet we want. So that I think for is this, very critical for the, for the student, solar sailing. For the students on the show, I want to emphasize that uh, uh, you may have heard of the solar wind, but we're not using the solar wind. That's an order, of, that's three orders of magnitude smaller than the solar photon pressure that uh, pushes the sail, that, that creates the force. So it's, uh, uh, we, we use the sailing analogy quite a bit. You want to understand that it's not the solar wind, which is, of course, the electrons and protons and neutrons that, are, that come out of the sun, but it's the, uh, the solar photons, the light pressure itself, which uh, creates the force. And in fact, once we are uh, going beyond the orbit of Jupiter, we may well just drop the sails because they will be not effective at that, at that distance. So we get the most uh, energy is from the proximity to the sun. Trying to find my button to bring myself back. <laughs> uh, but that, that is, a, so the idea is that now you have to bring a sail really the closer to this basically sounds like the closer to the sun the more solar radiation pressure you're able to acquire and therefore the the more uh momentum or delta v uh as they say in the biz right you, you get the faster you can accelerate to exactly uh, right how the, uh, the, how the well how close can we get right now i'm sorry yeah uh, so my uh, my question then is how close does our current technology allow us to in principle, get to the sun. We haven't tried anything like this before, but we have. We, first of all, we have flown solar sails before. Yes. Yes. We uh, well. First of all, there's a Parker Solar Probe right now going quite close to the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and just a few solar radii. Uh, it will make its final approach, but it doesn't have a solar sail. The limiting factor here will be the material uh, temperature that the material of the solar sail can stand and we're investigating different materials now we certainly know we can go inside mercury's orbit which is uh, roughly 0.35 au from the sun uh, but we can certainly go in closer we probably can certainly go within 0.2 au even with a kapton sail uh, which we know we could make with uh, plastic material and we're investigating even more exotic materials that may allow us to go closer Solar sails have flown. There have been two very successful solar sail flights. One by the Japanese, Ikaros, which flew 
roughly from the Earth to, uh, to the vicinity of Venus, and the other, the Planetary Society's Light Sail, a project which I started, and proud to say, uh, which is flying in Earth orbit, and has flown amazingly well for more than a year now. Uh, the sail, which is made of ultra-thin mylar, uh, just five microns thick, uh, has held up and is still integral and still uh, in good shape and being able to be maneuvered and, and keeps fighting the energy that wants to drag it back into the Earth's atmosphere, and so it's been able to stay in orbit uh, now for more than a year. So I think we can say that solar sailing is certainly practical, and by the way, solar sailing in Earth orbit is something you don't like to do at all. You don't, Nobody wants to sail a boat in a harbor. We want to get out into the ocean. We want to get out into interplanetary and interstellar space, and uh, and that's a much easier job for steering and controlling the spacecraft, although it will be a much more challenging job in terms of uh, taking along all the capabilities that we have to work over those long distances. So, uh, okay, so as far as, so you're saying then with some technologies that are at least under development, we could get even closer, right? Uh, but I understand that there's a little matter of developing and proving the technology first. Is that right? Well, solar, we could fly, I think with today's technology, we could fly as close as two tenths of an AU and we could wow. go around the sun with a small spacecraft. And in fact, we're proposing, uh, in Slava's study that he's leading, we're proposing to do a technology demonstration mission, which doesn't try to achieve the speeds we need to get to get to the solar gravity lens focus, but tr tries to achieve twice the Voyager speed and go out of the solar system just to test and prove that we can control a solar sail and, and and we think we can do that in the next three or four years so uh, we're ready to undertake that now the bigger job of trying to get a little uh, closer to the sun and having a longer live spacecraft that can work out at distances of hundreds of an a hundreds of AUs in the interstellar medium uh, beyond the orbit of Pluto, beyond the Kuiper belt, uh, beyond the bow shock that surrounds our solar system, which is where the interstellar wind from the sun meets the, uh, inter I'm sorry, the interplanetary wind from the sun meets the interstellar wind from the stars, uh, and out to 500 or 600 or 700 AU, uh, that's going to take some years to develop, maybe as much as 10 years, maybe as much as uh, or eight to ten years, but we still hope we could launch by 2030 and get to the uh, and get to see this habitable exoplanet uh, by the year 2050. It's uh, you just said year 2050, 30 years from now. 30 yeah, years from now. Yeah, if we could launch in 10 years and go at 28, 25 AU per year, we might get out there in the. 2050s or maybe the 2060s, uh, but the, the key is uh, the key is in the next few years we want to do that we want to establish the speed record right now and uh, and I I'd like this is something I don't I don't know that I'll be alive in 2060 to see the exoplanet when we get there I'll try yeah uh, but uh, I don't think we're, I don't think I'll make it to then okay. but I sure want to see get the speed record and own that uh, which I think I can do in the next five six years so all right well well talking about that speed record again uh this is uh something and i and i folks i realize that i've got the wrong camera up for this animation uh but uh, uh I, I got slava there and you know what can i say i'm still figuring out how to do this job but uh anyway you can see the uh, uh this is a concept that's being put together by a company i believe that uh, you've worked with uh, lou called explore incorporated and uh, can you tell us a little bit about? Uh, uh, sorry, tell us a little bit about uh, Explorer's role in this, or how they're well, fitting into this. They're a new, they're what we call a new space company, a private company who is unique among the new space companies in that they want to do solar system missions. They don't want to just do uh, Earth orbit and lunar orbit missions. They want to go beyond Earth orbit into the solar system and provide commercial services at the planets uh, ultimately. So they have a business model, if you will, that I'm interested in because I like to get to the planets. Uh, but the uh, the challenge here is now they're undertaking the idea of 
uh, developing a small sat uh, with a solar sail, uh, and they can do this in a low-cost way uh, in, within the uh, boundaries of the uh, cost parameters that we think we can raise in the uh, in, from NASA in the uh, early technology studies, and maybe with some private uh, partners that can join with us. And so, Explore is a company that will. Uh, is going to do the preliminary design of this mission, and if it all works out well, we'll know that within a year or two, uh, then we'll be able to raise the rest of the money to actually conduct the technology demonstration mission. Well, I certainly hope that uh, this little live stream, because I'm, I'm sure that uh, you know everybody from NASA are, are undoubtedly watching this, because what else are they going to do on a Friday night? And uh, they're going to see well, this. Also, gonna say, yeah, the students you referred to earlier that are getting rich will they, they may want to come in. Oh man, yeah, this. they're they're going they're going to own the world. You know, so, so I, what I want to do is uh, take a moment and and uh, again just want to thank. All of our uh, viewers tonight, I just see a lot of comments coming in. This is uh, really exciting. I understand that my audio is a little bit hot. I apologize. Uh, I hope I can uh, in increase the audio of my guests and decrease my audio. Uh, I know my students would like me to decrease my audio all the way down. Uh, but anyway, um, let me uh, let me just say that I thought we I know we had some questions earlier. If you guys have any questions at all, please please, please, please type them in the comments and I'll put them up here on screen so that we can respond to them or our guests can respond to them. Uh, but um, if you are, uh, I guess what I wanted to know is a little bit about, um, have you thought about the, the, kind of, uh, the kind of target that you would like to be able uh, to observe? What, what sort of target would be a good first target for you? Uh, we would love to observe a target that has uh, uh, conditions consistent with life the way we know it. So a planet uh, orbiting its host star in a habitable zone, and we have indication that this planet has atmosphere. And um, so at least that would be good for us to go, because now we have a good motivation. So uh, with the telescope and coronagraph uh, being placed in the slow gravitational lens focus, uh, along the focal line, we should be able to do imaging and spectroscopy. And spectroscopy, think about what we can do with um, measurements of oxygen, nitrogen, methane, and uh, correlating these measurements with the surface uh, uh, features on the planet. So potentially we can understand whether or not those folks who live on those exoplanets use the same fossil technologies that we use here. Maybe they're much maybe they are much smarter than we are uh, than we are. and so we can learn something from them so potentially we can understand the state of the civilization if there is so the the set of questions are just amazing but studying alien life that is amazing uh that would be an amazing achievement to, to say the least <laughs> we have a question here uh from uh raymond wiley dr Turishev, is it feasible to view objects within our solar system with the gravitational lens? Can an object well, be too near to view with the SGL? It's an interesting question. What do you think about that? It is a very good question. Uh, going back to the uh, optical properties of the solar gravitational lens, or any lens, you wanna, if, you, if you have a lens, you want to put an object into focal point if you have a, if you have a normal lens. And for the, uh, and the focal point for typical lens would be uh, within maybe centimeters or meters, and so it's, it's very easy to achieve in a practical design. The solar gravitational lens, the focal area begins at 550 astronomical units. So before that, there will be no, uh, no light amplification, except if you will be using neutrinos. If you, if, you, if you would be using a solar gravity lens to observe neutrinos, because neutrinos will go through the sun and they will focus at the distance of about 39 astronomical units away from the sun. But even for that, you want to have an extra solar source of neutrinos. So it will be impossible to observe our own planets with a solar gravitational lens, but planets uh, Proxima, uh, at, at, at Proxima B and uh, our stellar neighbor and any other planet up to 100, 150 astronomical units away, we can use the lens to do a very interesting observations. My eyes just bugged out because you said we could potentially it, we could emit we could detect rather lensed neutrinos from yes. background objects oh wow For okay you need to have a <laughs> uh, 
for that, we need to have a, so a, a source of uh, neutrinos, maybe mm -hmm. a center of our galaxy. Uh, this yeah. is where maybe the source of neutrinos would be. And as we know, a neutrino will go through the sun, the sun and the solar gravity will, will focus neutrinos much closer. So mm -hmm. we don't have to wait oh, until 550 so years. It's only 39. My goodness. Uh, so what would the aperture of the telescopes be, uh, Piper Trip's asking, uh, the telescopes on board the spacecraft that you're sending out there? We, we are thinking about a meter class aperture. Mm -hmm. And for that, we can use uh, solar sailing. And then once the solar sailing spacecraft are launched, uh, those solar sailing spacecraft will have components of the larger aperture. And so once they're flying by, uh, let's say maybe after flying by, by, by Mars or Jupiter, they're dropping their sails and they form a larger telescope it's in flight uh, in, in space assembly. And so in, in, in space assembly, we're not talking about assembling big telescopes, meters, hundreds of meters in, the, in diameter. We're talking about small telescopes. We can fly segments, so let's say 30 centimeter segments, and then assemble an aperture, maybe a meter and a half aperture in space, in flight. And that would be easy to do. Uh, I lose track of what Slava just said. The, the yeah. idea that, that we could do this with a meter two meter class telescope instead of a 90 kilometer telescope yeah <laughs> the only way we were able to image uh, uh, another world now so this is what that solar gravity lens i don't think you gave this number slava but it's an amazing number it gives you a hundred billion uh on the object that you're looking at and that's what makes it so cool. amazing that's yeah that that's quite that's quite a, an amplification we had another question here uh boy the questions are, are coming in here uh pretty quick so i want to try to get to as many of them as i can uh would we watch uh hiroshi loves you asks would we watch different wavelengths of light such as visible infrared and uv so what wavelengths absolutely. would we be able to do these imaging? absolutely at this moment we are studying visible and infrared so anywhere between let's say 0.5 micron to maybe 10 micron and so but potentially the lens uh can work all the, all the way to uv but the sensors will be uh, different so we are currently studying visible and infrared because technology is available for those sensors and can be deployed on this uh, spacecraft and look going back to your uh, to your question uh to, to your to your to your point is indeed uh our study shows that we can look at the exo earth our own planet at 100 light years away and within about a year of integration time we can make an image of that object with roughly 200 by 200 uh, pixels across it's only within one year to do this with a regular telescope with a telescope uh, you need to multiply 90 uh, kilometers by 200 so that's the diameter of the telescope we are talking about to have a comparable uh, resolution which is impossible it's a, sure. I, I should say i should say it's sim simply infeasible oh yeah it's it's not likely right so so the image uh, the image resolution uh to this question the image resolution that we're looking at for the first image maybe just a couple hundred by 100 pixels uh yes. yeah but hey you know what i mean that would be 100 by 100 pixels of another planet and seeing its surface and so uh, chris uh, chris maybe just a couple of comments on this uh, people, uh, quite often we've been asked a uh, question uh, whether or not we can observe other planetary systems. Mm -hmm. With the current technology that we have, with the solar sailing, we can observe one planetary system, not just single planet around that uh, host star. It's like uh, uh, Cassini or uh, Galileo spacecraft went to uh, Saturn and uh, Jupiter and studied entire system of satellites around those uh, planets. We can do the same with observing uh, the, the planetary system and maybe moons of those uh, of those planets in uh, orbiting a host star. So it's a single planetary mission. Hmm. Uh, the, yeah, that's uh, uh, which can right. be uh, which will be able to observe a lot of uh, objects around host star. If you want to observe another planet in another system, then you need to send another right. telescope in another direction that looks exactly. back at that SGL. Yeah. And currently what we do in our design, we are, uh, we are actually relying on uh, the um, maturation of small spacecraft. They are becoming inexpensive and the access to space is uh, uh, drastically redu uh, reduced. The, the cost of access to space is drastically reduced. So for our technology demonstration mission, that will be able to bring a lot of, uh, to, to, to reach many firsts 
the, the faster spacecraft, the, the very capable solar sailing spacecraft. You're talking about a very inexpensive mission. And so scaling up, um, potentially we can talk about a mission that is affordable and maybe uh, fl uh, flying several of those uh, missions to different planetary systems may, may, may be affordable with the technology that we have or develop now. Well, you, you mentioned that because uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up, uh, you know, cost. I, I know that maybe you don't have an exact dollar figure on this, uh, uh, but uh, it does seem like you've chosen a mission architecture that is actually designed to be low cost, high bang for the buck, right? I mean, uh, Lou, you mentioned uh, Explore. They're a new space company. They're trying to build, uh, you know, make affordable missions, I think, to the uh, to the outer solar system. And I understand yeah, some other design, companies, yeah. Go ahead. Our design goal here is, uh, for the technology demonstration mission, is to do it for just several millions of dollars, maybe 10, maybe 10 million dollars, maybe even 20 million dollars, somewhere in that range. But something that's actually quite affordable in, in, in terms of space things. The ultimate solar gravity lens focus mission might, will of course be hundreds of millions of dollars, but even that compares you could launch 10 or 20 of those for the cost of the multi-billion dollar missions that we end up having to do what we call the flagship missions that, mm -hmm. that, ex that, that we're now having to build with much heavier spacecraft. So we, yes, you were quite correct. We have chosen an architecture which not only lowers the cost of the individual spacecraft, but makes it possible to talk about building multiple spacecraft to do many such missions to many such tar interesting targets and, and, and objects. So this uh, and and these would be small, light, lightweight. You, you called them small sats earlier. So you're talking about uh, really small, smaller scale spacecraft. Yeah, under right? uh, under under 50 kilograms, and the uh, uh, less than I weigh. The uh, uh, yeah, the uh, basically the, yes, these are small sats that are uh, that are under 50 kilograms, maybe as low as 20, 20, 30 kilograms uh, that we wow. could. Uh, uh, produce and and could do that. Now we know we can do that. It's not just solar sails which have advanced in maturity, but small sats have advanced in maturity. Hmm. There's many of them now in Earth orbit. Even the Defense Department is using them for sophisticated missions. And there's two of them have already flown to Mars and performed communication functions out there. The Marco, Marco? Uh, uh, spacecraft uh, uh, were the first interplanetary. Uh, small sets that that could do this. So we, this is a, an exploding technology that we're trying to ride on the coattails of. Oh, that's that's just fantastic. So it sounds like uh, this is a you know back in the 1990s we heard about smaller, faster, cheaper, uh, but uh, it sounds like now it's finally starting to come to fruition. Uh, I did have a, another question I wanted to uh, to bring up, and I just wish I could find it. Uh, and if I can, I will I'll certainly uh, list it. But uh, well, actually I'll go ahead with this one. Uh, uh, Piper Trip asks, "What would be the power source for these spacecraft?" I, that's an interesting question because you really wouldn't be able to use solar sail. Uh, sorry, solar panels no. at that distance. No. You're just not getting enough photons. So how do you power these things? No, you uh, you will have to have some power along on the way. And we're, in fact, your uh, questioner identified one of our key technology challenges. We know we can do it with small nuclear. Uh, what they call RTGs, radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Uh, these are small, but not quite small enough yet. And that's one of the developments we're working on. People are researching nuclear batteries, uh, mm -hmm. but there will be nuclear material that will have to use, not, not a nuclear reactor. You won't have to produce a fission reaction or anything like that. You basically will use the heat of nuclear material the decay heat of the radiation to heat and it's just a clever way of converting that heat energy into enough electricity and we won't need a lot of power it's a small spacecraft and so we'll need only a few watts so we hope we can keep uh, that uh, that whatever is the RTG or nuclear battery design into manageable size so uh, this is basic and that's technology that we've actually had for a long long time we're just talking well, the about the RTG next generation technology. Yeah, the RTG yeah. technology has been with us a long time. And there were small RTGs 40, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, they've gotten a little bigger because they've gotten, as everything else does, gets more demanding. And mm -hmm. most people want a lot of power. Right. We actually want a little powers. So we're trying to get them to think in, in terms of small again. 
Uh, and to this uh, other question, and Slava, this may uh, fall, you, fall under you, it's uh, what kind of computer would be required to convert the data? Because you're looking back and you're seeing a blur of light that is the sun's gravitational lens. So what kind of computer do you need to actually turn that into an image? Is this, uh, uh, yeah, this is a very important uh, uh, part of the infrastructure that we need to develop for the mission. Essentially, how much computing power do we fly with us? So the current uh, FPGAs that we are flying today, they are capable of significant processing on board already. So we prob probably use either a flight qualified GPU that is already available and uh, sort of uh, a significant pentaflop, no, a teraflop computing uh, in space, which is uh, being demonstrated. So potentially mm -hmm. we can take a teraflop computing with us. And so the challenge there will be the thermal design to sort of reject the heat that this uh, objects generate on the spacecraft. But that, that is now engineering issue. So uh, both of them, FPGAs or, or, or GPUs, can be used for this. But probably a GPU, which is more advanced at the moment. And so, but once it will be space qualified, I think that will be a very good uh, uh, candidate for, for this type of uh, computer on flight. Would you be uh, just bringing, uh, so in other words, there have to be some initial raw processing done Absolutely. on board, right, in order to get it ready for, and then obviously it would be sent down to, to transmit to Earth some out, days, weeks uh, later uh, at, from that distance, right? Uh, we, we can do both, actually. We can do a lot of pre-processing on board, and we are thinking maybe to send down to the ground maybe all the key data uh, sets, which would indicate the quality of the data that we have, sort of the control data sets, and leave the processing on board and basically send us just postcards. And so potentially <laughs> that can that can be done and because it's uh, the algorithm for recovery for image recovery is quite straightforward so once you collect the data you may either send the whole data set back which will require significant i know communication capability or may you just process and send just postcards pixel by pixel and so imagine yourself you're sitting on your computer and suddenly a bunch of pixels start to appear on your laptop and you you see how from those pixels you just form a, an, an image of that object and so that can be done because basically you can do this either in flight or back in you know uh, on, in the laboratory back on the ground one oh, that's that's amazing it's and see the key idea this, christopher yeah, here is that yeah, yeah. we want we want spacecraft to be fully autonomous because right. we cannot rely uh, on the humans being in the loop all the time right because the light travel time is four days it's not minutes so one way a light travel time is four days so we cannot maneuver or navigate the spacecraft from a control room on the ground we have to rely on their smarts so as the spacecraft will be tucking into the sun there will be area where there will be uh, there will be phase where when there will be no communication because it will be so close to the sun it has to be autonomous it has to be able to control orient itself to adjust whatever solar activity uh, the spacecraft is going through at the moment and then when it go, once it leaves the solar system, we don't need to ask spacecraft to send us, you know, a lot of information, uh, or housekeeping information all the time. We want to delegate those authorities to the spacecraft itself. It has mm. to be fully autonomous. Anomal identification, recovery, uh, conflict resolution between multiple spacecraft it has to be done in flight. That's and, the and only way to fly this. And that's not a... Uh, and that's not a crazy fangled idea i mean parker solar probe is up is flying autonomously uh the the, the osiris rex mission to Bennu had to navigate autonomously you know they couldn't joystick that thing uh from earth so yeah this is a uh this is a certainly doable thing and for, uh, new, for, for new horizons remember there was a beacon navigation when spacecraft would have fallen asleep for some for quite some time and about six months, it will just wake up and say, okay, I'm still alive and still go, and, and then goes to sleep. <laughs> we'll do something like that. So once in a while, it will be just uh, sending us messages saying, I'm still alive, everything is fine. Go back to bed. That's all. <laughs> go back to bed. Oh, here's, here's another picture. Here, enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about, uh, you know, again, just talking about the idea of bringing, taking something that seems utterly fanciful, being able to actually convert, you know, photons of light from a distant planet being lensed by the sun into an image and yeah quite possibly within the next 30 years or so you know and uh that's within, that's within the tremendous. lifetime of present generation of people so yeah we're talking about within the life of present generation which is we are moving there 
idea from science fiction into the mainstream of astronomy. Just, just to be clear, and president so, present generation includes us, right? I mean, we're going to see. Okay, okay, good. I just want to make sure we're seeing this. Yeah, all right. I want, I, I want to make sure that we see the alien world. <laughs> Well, I, I really want to thank uh, both my guests. We ran a little bit over time, and I apologize for that, everybody. I was hoping to be done by 9, but I, we started a little late, and I, we had such a good conversation. I just want to thank my guests once again, Dr. Slava uh, Todyshev, uh, the principal investigator of the, uh, of, the, of the Solar Gravitational Lens Focus Mission, and Louis Freeman, the man who makes missions happen all right from the planet the co-founder and uh, uh emeritus of the planetary society oh and by the way i should also point out if you'd like to learn a little bit more about this mission i did make a video about it now that you've heard from the experts you can hopefully forgive my video where i try to interpret uh what what slava very, very patiently taught me thank you very much uh, but i did a video about uh the solar gravitational lens mission and i did a video about solar sailing and i hope we can have both of you back on uh in the future to talk a little bit of, more about these things this is such an exciting thing but there's one more thing i like to tell everybody and it's this if you also would like to learn more about this mission i happen to know that there's going to be a uh, a special on a new series uh, of called moonshots which will be premiering uh next month so well it's gonna it, Apparently we're going to be on we're going to be on TV, or we're going to be on Bloomberg. Uh, uh, there's like a new Bloomberg channel coming out, uh, and it'll be uh, be visible uh, worldwide. I think after the New Year, but in the United States, uh, there will be a uh, a special coming out called Moonshots, and one of the, they're talking about high concept ideas, and one of the ideas that they wanted to explore was the solar gravitational lens mission, and so uh, so. Uh, these gentlemen here are going to be uh, in the show, and I, I think I think I'm going to be in it too. But um, but wa watch these guys. Terrific. <laughs> well, one more one more one more reason that we expect 2021 to be a better year. It's got to be better. Oh man, Absolutely. it's got to be better. <laughs> well, thank you both for for joining me, and uh, I just want to. Uh, say again to all of you, thank you all for joining us and uh, for being patient with me as I fiddle my way around uh, uh, the art of live streaming. I hope to get a little bit better about this, uh, but we are going to be continuing to do these uh, sorts of uh, uh, planetarium, whatever, you know, get-togethers online. I'll be doing another one next month, uh, guests to be announced, but there'll be more guests coming. And thank you so much once again for joining us. Please, if you uh, enjoyed this, please make sure that uh, you uh, subscribe and ring that notification bell. There's a little subscribe button right down there, so just make sure you hit that button and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new videos. And if you uh, also, I never did say thank you to my Patreon supporters for coming out tonight and helping uh, support Launchpad Astronomy, and not just tonight, but all the time. I'm so thankful, and oh man, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, NGC6543, one of my patrons, uh, for, uh, who, you're already supporting me, man. <laughs> thank you. I, 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 I can't do this without you all, and your support means a lot, whether it's a like or whether it's a a comment or whether it's a share or a patreon or a super chat it doesn't matter just thank you because what's the point in doing this if we all can't have a little bit of fun right so uh once again my thanks to my guests and as always stay home stay healthy and stay curious my friends good night